Hello and welcome to season two, episode five of the Let's Face It podcast. This is my journey with, and we'll have two actually today, Stephen Mallon and Cricky Gallagher, uh, two Clippenville footballers who um, both have their own journeys through football and school football and stuff like that. And they're st- also starting up um, their own wee coaching company as well in the next couple of weeks, um, which we're very proud uh, to be a part of. Um, Stephen and Christopher both are going to be ambassadors for Let's Face It, but we'll talk about that a wee bit more um, in the podcast. But uh, a huge thanks tonight to Alistair and Aileen and David and the team at RO Travel. They've agreed to come on board for the next couple of episodes and um, yeah, sponsor the next couple of episodes. It's it's fantastic. David phoned me last week and, 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 and offered his services and offered what he may, could maybe bring to Let's Face It. And, you know, every week the sponsorships are, you know, they're coming in and it's it's tough to get sponsors, obviously, with, with the current climate and to have David um, and Aileen and Alistair and co from, from RO Travel there in Andersonstown coming on board and help me for the next couple of weeks is, is actually... It's amazing, and um, you know it just keeps the show on the road, and it keeps these having great guests, and um, you know every week. So it's so it's it's amazing, and a huge thanks to them. Is but you know our old travels travel agents is a well established uh, local travel agent set in the middle of our local community in Anderson Anderson's town for over thirty five years. Uh, they offer travel services for all over the world, making people's dreams and wishes come true and creating many a memory for people of all ages. So, yeah, it's just directly just facing the busy bee there in Andy Town. If you go in the RO travel and ask for Aileen or David or any of them and still look after you and uh, some fantastic packages and holidays and all that crack. So, yes, thanks a million to RO travel for sponsoring this week and next week's and maybe the week after uh, podcast. I really appreciate it. But um, we'll crack on. What's the crack, lads? All good. All oh, good. This is my first threesome, so um, no, it's great to have you on, and it's great whenever Stephen you messaged me there last a couple of weeks ago about you know about what you were doing and um, about the possibility of, of doing something together, and I think it's brilliant what you, what you are doing. Uh, tell me a wee bit more what what is the crack like? Because uh, even I don't really know. Like what are, what are you starting up or what's what's the plan? Um, no, so we we kind of just looked at it as like. Obviously, spent the time we spent in England, you see a lot of the academies over there and how much kind of contact time the kids are getting over there in the academies compared to what kids are getting here. Um, like, uh, before I moved, I was probably doing Tuesday and a Thursday, one hour each week. And then when I went over, you see academy lads there and they're doing four or five nights a week. So it was just more, we thought, if we could give kids in the area that, you know, had an interest in football and whatever, if we could give them a bit more contact time um, doing specific training, it would kind of bridge the gap a little bit, even, even if it's lads that don't want to go across to England but want to go play Irish League or whatever. The step from training two nights a week to going in full time is, is a big difference. So if we were able to give, obviously, kids that extra, if it's an hour a week, two hours a week, to kind of bridge the gap and, and bring on their skills and stuff like that, just thought like it was an opportunity to do that and obviously help kids that want to go on the journey that we've kind of been on a little bit. No, and I think it's class because, you know, you constantly hear kids and things over here and I'm, I'm not big into soccer, but even growing up in school and I went to school with with, with some people who, who everybody thought they're going to make it, they're going to make it, they're going to make it, but... It's like, what does that actually mean? And the, as you said, there's a massive gap between England and mm. what happens here and, and the hours that people put in the, their their craft, if you like, the, the to succeed is, you know, it does take a lot of hard work and dedication. I suppose I can even see that from, from my end of it, from hurling and stuff. Like if you're not if you're not out there most nights against the wall or whatever, just keeping mm. your touch in and stuff like that, then you do fall fall behind. Like So, no, I think it's incredible. So what, what does that look like then? Do you use, would you just be going in the schools or what? what what will you be doing? I think at the start, you know, we probably will look at schools, but uh, it's going to be mainly, we're going to start off with small groups, so groups of four. Okay. And like like Stephen says, you know, it's all about that contact time. So rather than having, say, 8, 10, 12, a smaller group, you're going to get more detail in. So hopefully it can help improve a lot better. Class. And what are you going to call it? Evolve Football Coaching. Evolve, Evolve Football yeah. Coaching. So, and you're launching it this week, aren't you? Yeah, so yeah. we're we're looking at setting up the page and stuff this week, and obviously just getting it out there and and get a a feel for well, you interest know interest and stuff. Yeah, class. And I think like even the the, the very fact that you've you've sort of walked that path, um, 
like being in England and and, and, and and trying to have a right go at it and make football obviously your your careers like um for jobs and stuff like that. But tell me a wee bit more about your experiences, Stephen, in in England, like um you know, and then obviously you had a, a current you had a bit of a spell in the Irish League too in in, in the South. Um what, what, what was England like for you and how much was that gap like what you were just talking about there in terms of, you know, time and ability, even like strength and condition and the lifestyle, I suppose, and no, stuff like that? Uh, no, I, I find it tough enough. Um, obviously, I grew up, or even growing up, that's always what I wanted to do. Um, that was always my goal, to get to England. Um, but it's like one thing getting there, obviously staying there is, is the next thing and... You know, I moved away at 16, away from home, moved in with a family, um, and you're almost confined to your own room, and you're going to training, coming back, and you're stuck in your room the rest of the night, and then it's on repeat every day, and obviously moving over, I thought, like, this is the life, and unreal and stuff, and don't get me wrong, it was, I had great What club were you at, sorry? Sheffield United. Sheffield United. Um, but, like, it's... I'm not, like it's not made it's hard it is tough because I found like when I moved over um, as I say you're moving over there's a lot of English lads over there and, and they're living with parents they're from Sheffield whatever they're going back to their families and as I say I was going back to a house um, of people I didn't know that I'd just met um, and probably sat in my room six, seven, eight hours a day um, and even at that about the contact time like as I said earlier, I went from one hour, two hours training a week to being in six days a week from half eight in the morning till three o'clock doing double pitch sessions and a gym session. So I was going from two hours a week to maybe five, six hours a day of training. Like, um, and it actually it took me a while to adjust. Like, um, probably like the first six months, I remember, like it was just completely new to me. Like, um, very tough even like just on the body and, and everything it got as well as being away from home um, mentally tough like at 16 um, so yeah it was it was a, it was a struggle moving over then I kind of adapted quick enough because it comes to a point where you're like this is what I want to do and listening to Podrick um, he spoke about sacrifices and they are the things you've got to sacrifice you are going to miss your family but it has to be done um, I always said like my main reason for wanting to be successful in football was to give back to my family and being away from them for six, seven years, if it meant I could go on and have a career and give back, then obviously it was going to be worth it. Yeah, and that's powerful. Like, and uh, We all have our whys. And even like whenever you do go over there, you're only 16. You're, like, you, you, you're a child, do you know, yeah. and... Um, it must have been a very lonely place at times too, like having to do that, um, especially as you said about certain players going home to their parents' house and stuff, um, you know, and being lonely in a different country, even though it's it's not that far away, you know, it, it, it can lead to your head telling you certain things and was there ever any of that sort of what am I doing here, self-doubt or anything like that creeping um, in? Yeah, I think, I think so. At the start, there probably wasn't because... As I say, it was tough, but I was enjoying myself. It was, as I say, always what I wanted to do. Mm. It was kind of more when I got my first injury. Yeah. Um, I broke my foot and had to have surgery and knew that I'd be out for five, six months. And so for me, my like my little buzz was getting up and going to training and going out and training because I knew like each day you're getting better and you're getting closer to where you want to be. So obviously when I get injured, I felt like that was taken away from me and... That's when I found it a lot tougher because, like I said earlier about going and sitting in a room after training, it's easier when you've been training and you're enjoying it and whatever, but when you're going in to sit in a physio room from half eight to half three and not leaving the physio room only to get lunch, then you're going back to sit in another room. Like, as a day, fair enough, if it's a two-week injury or three-week injury, you can get through it, but when it's like five, six months and you're doing the same things over and over and... Looking back, I was, as you said, like you are a child and I wasn't thinking, oh, let's go do something else and take my mind off it and do all these other things. I was just going about my day where I was sat in two rooms and it was almost like I was waiting for the six months to be up. And that's kind of when you get in your head and you're 
like is this worth it like what am I doing I could be at home with my family and um, that's where I found it tough and as I, like I spoke to you before when I lost the buzz of not training I felt like I had to find the buzz somewhere else and that's when I kind of found the buzz in gambling it was like when I just when I placed a bet or something like that it gave me that buzz that I'd been missing for so long um, so it was probably like two three months into my injury when I actually started gambling um, and I found that kind of replaced the the buzz from not training uh, like I can relate to you a million percent because even the whole way growing up we were seeing like hurling football was just my release like just I yeah. loved it it gave me that buzz and it was just class and then um, Mags wasn't through an injury it was through like a, a situation that happened to me when I was a kid but it's something that I always banked up and like as soon as I found that first drink or that first bag of coke it was just like wow this is far better than hurling <laughs> football yeah. Do you know obviously you know with the buzz and stuff like that but and then all of a sudden the comes calm downs but with gambling and there's, there, there's I, I work obviously in, a, in an addiction treatment centre now at the minute and you know <clears throat> gambling's gambling's scary because people could tell <clears throat> if I was out of my head and ease yeah. or coke or whether I was took 20 pints or drunk um, you could see it in my eyes you could see what way I was getting on but with gambling you could have literally spent every money that's in your pocket online or yeah. through your app on your phone and no one knows about, <clears throat> no one knows about it do you know what I mean and yeah. you have to battle with that and you yeah. have to put on a fake face and th- was there ever any situations where you know, it did impact your your mental health or a gambling did take over? Um, yeah, so I, like like you said there, you kind of have to put on a face and no one knows. And, and I went like that for a good few months where I was getting paid and I was going into the physio room and I'd start gambling in the physio room because there's so much, only so much you can do rehab-wise, half eight to half three, <laughs> especially when you're injured. Like, and see as well, it was like the the part of the body is injured, you can't do anything to make it better for a certain while or whatever. So I was like, I found that was my kind of something to do. I need, um, like I was set there seven, eight hours. So that was my, like I just seen it as not a hobby, but just something to do because I was set around. So like I, it even started before I got into training. The lad that picked me up for training was in the physio with me and he was also gambling. So like I was getting into his car at quarter to eight in the morning already on Skybet gambling like and it was kind of only the boys that knew um, it was the other boys that gambling knew I was gambling um, so like I'd get paid and within two days my whole mum's wage was gone and I'm ringing family to say I have no money here making up stories of why I don't have money and then they're sending me money and I'm gambling that to try win back what I lost and at like 17, 18, I probably wasn't even le- like legal to gamble. But within two, three days, I had no money left. And I'm going about the month. Because after you ask for the first amount and you spend that, it's like I have the rest of the month to survive in a country by myself. And luckily you have digs, like that's what it was called in England where we lived. So you don't need to pay for food and that. So it was almost like at six, 16, 17 when you were given this money, I had nothing to spend it on. So I'd spend it all on gambling. And within, like, as I said, two, three days, I had no money left. Um, and it, that went on for months. Like, it was only maybe four or five months. I actually had two kind of separate occasions where the first time I went and spoke to my family and admitted, like, I've been gambling and that's where all my money's been going and that's why I've been asking for money. And straight away they flew over and um, it was all kind of like... I was telling them, right, I've got it sorted, and it was nipping the bud. And at the time, um, my ex-girlfriend, my family, my like, I spent a lot of time there, so my family were like, you know, keep an eye on him, like, make sure he's not. And that's when then I started to proper hide it from people because they knew I was gambling before, but then I went back into it after I ended up with another injury. Um, and as soon as I was back in the physio, it was like, just started again and and this time I was like I got to the point where I was setting alarms at half three in the morning waking 
us both up and me saying, oh, I've set my alarm for the wrong time. I'd roll over and pretend to go back to sleep. And I was actually on, like, basketball in America, bet, putting money on at half three, four <coughs> in the morning. Um, so it is, it, it does, it, it got to a point where I kind of, you didn't know what to do. It, it got to a point where I was just like, I spoke to my family, I'm back doing it. And, and I, that's where I kind of struggled in terms of, I didn't know where to turn to at that point. And where did you turn to? I I ended up, I FaceTimed my sister and I just broke down. I was like, I can't help myself. I can't, I don't know what to do. Like, again, I've spent all my money, like, and I've done it one too many times. Like, I don't know. And again, they flew over. Uh, but this time they actually brought me to GA. So I started going to Gamblers Anonymous, um, and that's when I finally actually got it sorted. Um, I think it was more some of the stories that I heard there. Like, I thought I was bad until I heard their stories, and it made me realise. It's almost like a reality check, like, what am I doing? I'm, I'm in England to be a footballer, and this is what I'm doing. And, like, obviously all that was a distraction from my football. And I, I wasn't focused on what I was supposed to be doing. And it was GA that actually sorted that. It was I went I was there for like ten weeks, going every Sunday night. I remember getting the bus there, like I didn't drive at the time, so I was getting the bus there at six o'clock at night to go to GA for two hours. Where you're sat in a room with everyone that has experienced the same things as you. So I found that's what that's what helped me hear another people's story and seeing that there is other people out there the same. And that was kind of when I finally stopped it and nipped it in the bud. Like, that's class. And even for you to have that understanding of what you needed to do, and like, <laughs> I'm proud of you. Do you know what I mean? I can't. St- I wanted to really say that there. Like, do you know, what? I really, really am because, and I know that feeling. Yeah. And I know how lonely it can be, and even the situation with your friends still doing it and stuff. So by you doing that with your friends and that you all having the crack around that, what that really does make you feel like what you're doing is normal. Yeah. But it's very much an on reality and a fantasy yeah. world, like in terms of the gambling and all this crack and wasting all your money. But the, the, the power of an AA room or a GA room or an NA room yeah. is absolutely unbelievable. And and you mentioned there about pe- different people's stories and stuff, and they do often mention about the not yet. You know, you haven't lost your family yet, or you haven't yeah. lost your house yet, or your car yet, or whatever. Um, and that's why, I, like, I even continue to still love going into an AA room because there's people there who have lost fucking everything through addiction, like, and we're two young lads and we have things going for us. So for addiction to take control of us would be a sin, like, you know, for yeah. anyone, I suppose. And but for you to show the maturity that you did, that you did in England, because like <laughs> sometimes I can think I'm worse than going to an AA meeting, to be honest yeah. with you. But for you to actually do that and have that sort of self discipline, and you said dedication there earlier, but getting on that bus and going to a meeting and putting that first, like, um, it's obviously stood to you yeah. until today, like, and there's there's power in that, like, there's definitely is power in that, and I've never heard, I didn't know, I'd never heard that story, um, Stephen, like, and. You know, fair play to you because it's class. Mm-hmm. And just ju- just on even, do you know whenever people, and and correct, you may even be a bit helpless too, like in terms of, you know, growing up in school and stuff like. Because I was in a class with like your Shana Fosters and your Stevie Fowles and your mm-hmm. Cormac Dearies and all these boys who, who 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 I was convinced they were gonna like they were going there, like you know. I don't know that they're not doing too bad. I know Stevie's doing well in the in the limb field, yeah. and 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 Shane is obviously he's away out to do another club and stuff like. But you know, like and they haven't done too bad, which is fair enough. But like I I, I was uh, like we were all under the impression that these boys were going playing for Liverpool, like and yeah. like and I'm sure you were put up on that pedestal. Like we went to the same school, and yeah. like and I think like even looking down, you were I think you're two years younger than me, are you? A year anyway. And looking down and, and, and it was always sort of like, ah, oh, he's fucking, like, he's going to make it like a yeah, you know I, what I mean? Yeah, I think, like, a lot of people sort of, they just hear or see footballer. Yeah. And everyone assumes that because they see the Premier League on TV, yeah. they think it's this glamorous, you know. And listen, it's obviously, it is quite rewarding if you do well. 
But you know, the likes of Stephen Gunn, uh, Sheffield United, I went to Shrewsbury Town. Like, I was a League One club, and it's not all glitz and glam. It's literally like, it's not a lot of difference in terms of some of the clubs back home now. And I would say, in terms of obviously at academy level, but some of the full time clubs here now could probably be in a better situation than what I was when I first went over. But I think, like I said, there are a lot of people, like you say, in school, they just see you as like, oh, you play football, oh, you're going across the water or whatever, to like, as if you're going to go and live this big yeah. superstar lifestyle, but it isn't like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. And I was actually, I had Kira Daly in, you know, the, the makeup uh-huh. girl in the other day, and we were, we were talking about this, about people putting certain people up in a pedestal, and, um, and like, you can't help but do, do that, you know what I mean? If I see your Instagram or user playing for Cliff and Ball, I'm sure there's young lads that are looking up and going, wow, they're amazing, yeah. they play for Cliff and Ball and their lives are class, you know? You, you know, and, and then obviously what you're saying there about going away, there's probably people in your school at that time, your age, going, I'd love to be like him. Mm-hmm. But tell me a wee bit more then about your experience in England. What, what was that like for you? I loved it. Like, obviously, I went across, we went across the same year, both 16. Um, I went to Shrewsbury Town. And, like, to this day, I sort of... When people ask me, I'm a wee bit like oh, Shrewsbury, you know, because not a lot of people know yeah. who it is. But to me, like, I'm quite proud of that because, Absolutely. like Stephen, we grew up playing football together, but it's what you've always wanted to do. So me getting there, it was like, right, well, I'm going to use this as a stepping stone to hopefully be able to progress and go through the ranks and get higher up. And uh, But no, I loved it. Like, I um, like likewise, going into digs, you move in with a family of, like, just complete randomers, you know, like... I uh, flew into Liverpool on the day moving over, got picked up by our bus driver, drove down, and like you're rocking up at a house, knocking the door, and it's like, right, come on in, like you're part of the family now. So it's, it is strange. Meet and the foggers. Literally, you know, like, so I remember like walking in the door, and don't get me wrong, I was with a family who were unbelievable, you know, they looked after me so well, and I, like, you know, I can't say a bad word about them, but so I literally had like three suitcases, like brought it up the stairs, right, that's your room. And I was in digs with another lad who was from Cambridge. So they put us together because Cambridge was like four hours away from Shrewsbury. And a lot of the other lads were quite local. So like he says, then boys like go home at the weekends mm. or after training. So they put us together because he wasn't going to be making a four hour drive every day or maybe every weekend. And obviously I wasn't going to be flying mm. home every weekend. And then um, turns out he, uh, he got a stress fracture on his back like within the first two months. So I ended up living on my own, basically, because he had to go back to Cambridge for a few months. So, But I didn't mind that, to be honest with you. I, I actually quite liked my own sort of, my own space. Mm. And just, I know that sounds a bit sad, like being on my own. I don't I don't mind it. Yeah. Obviously, it's nice having that company, but I quite enjoyed that, going to training, coming back, just chilling out, and then looking forward to doing it again. And I was quite fortunate that I didn't have any injuries yeah. or anything bad. You know, I had a few niggles. But like Stephen says, it's only a couple of weeks, so you can you can deal with that in your head. But um, no, I I loved it like so did. That's class, unreal, and even like it's such a it's a, like it'll stand I suppose even whenever you're going back now to, to give back into our community and do them small group sessions, even in terms of like finances, right? Because obviously you were obviously getting a few quid there, and you were getting a few quid when you were away and stuff like that, and you were getting free grub and free digs, yeah. as you say. Um, what? Do you think there should be more like education around, you know, maybe young footballers going away? I don't know whether the AFA or anything can step in and do this, but, you know, give more young lads education in terms of managing their finances or what to do when they get injured, you know, in terms of like player welfare, what, yeah. did you know, things like that. What I think you? probably nowadays there's probably a few, I'd say there'd be a few more things in place. Right, okay. Um, even with like the, within the AFA, they've got the academy set up. So I, I would like to think that there is that sort of structure of, if you are going across, this is how certain things right, are being okay. dealt with. Now, whenever I came home, there was a welfare officer who reached out just to make sure, obviously, so some people can, you know, take it one way or the other. Absolutely. Um, so they were quite good with me that way, you know, just in terms of reaching out um, and seeing maybe what I wanted to do next in terms of education, jobs, stuff like that. So, but I would say like now, it's probably a lot better than what it was what was that four years ago yeah now? and so it should be like because it is such an important yeah. you know and even the percentages of people actually you know <coughs> as you say going over and making that breakthrough mm-hmm. in england it's very slim um yeah. so having that sort of backup plan that yeah. you can sort of you know y- you have the, the 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 correct life skills to live yeah. your life rather yeah. do you know what i mean um what david so we'll push on then to even now so you're both obviously you both grew up same age 
same age went to England and now you're back. You were the, with the Glens. Oh, yeah. You were with Bohemians. Uh, I think you think I know what I'm talking about, would you? <laughs> <laughs> you're with oh, Bohemians man. and uh, and now you're both reunited, I suppose, yeah. at, at back at um, over at Solitude in Clivenville. How's that going? I will. I've obviously been there just just over a year now. Um, no, I've been loving it. Like you know, obviously last year we had a very good season, mm. and I know we just missed out on the league by a point, which was you know it's hard to take, but. You know, I think we can sort of keep building and, you know, push forward again. So, yeah, like I said, it was a good year last year and hopefully we can build on it. Seems to be a good buzz about it, Stephen. Yeah, no, definitely. Obviously, when I, I only came in the summer, um, but I'd been speaking to him and I'd spoke to the manager before and, and obviously what they're doing, like even last season, how close they came and then this year, you know, we want to push on. It's like Cliftonville have kind of old when they were winning leagues and stuff like that and see like it's a great group in terms of like, even just like the changing room in terms of lads like how they are and stuff Um, it's a great group but then like in terms of players like there's in terms of ability like in the changing room there's there's so much like so um it is it's, it's kind of exciting in a way because <clears throat> I kind of look at the group like we can go and do something we can go and win the league we can go and win trophies like so it is, it's exciting like to be a part of. It's class. And we're Clippenville in the top four, would I be right in saying this? Were they the only part time team last year in the top four? Um yeah, I think so. I think I think well, I read that somewhere. The top two. The top two, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well and that's so that's some some achievement. But yeah. are you all full time now? No. Or what so, way what's so the crack? It's like we so we we're part time but we're basically full time in, in a way because we're in Monday nights, we're in Tuesday nights, we're off Wednesday. We're in Thursday, um, we get Friday off and then we play Saturday. So you've two to three days off a week, and sometimes that can change because you might have a game Tuesday. So there's times you can end up mm. on Sunday as well. So you're in Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, like so. It is. It can be a busy enough schedule, but in terms of the proper full time stuff, it is a little bit less. But in that way, you kind of make up for it in the sessions that you do because it's like. A full time team will probably come in and do a bit of shape and a walkthrough and how they're going to play, and it'll not be as intense. But because you train on the Thursday and get the Friday off, you run into the ground like <laughs> on the Thursday. Cause it's like we'll make up for it. Yeah, I so. don't think there's I don't think there's a huge difference. You know, when I was at the Glens the year before last, there like and that was full time. Yeah, yeah, we had just went full time. Probably it was about two years into it. Um, but like there wasn't a lot of difference in terms of the only difference, like he says, might have been. A gym session or something mm. um so i don't think the, the the gap isn't as big as people think and i think that also comes from us doing like the action night on a monday plus you know a couple of times that we've tried to get a, a wednesday morning session obviously depending on some lads how, who actually have proper jobs and stuff um and then like he says the odd sunday would be in depending on fixtures so there's not a lot of difference and i think that was evident last year in terms of how well we competed with the full-time teams and I don't know what the points, what points we took from the likes of the full times teams, but you know, it wasn't it wasn't a big gap. So no, I, I, absolutely, absolutely, because and that's why I say like because someone made me aware of that sort of full time part time thing yeah. with Clippenville and how well you actually were doing, and and there does seem to be a good buzz as I said over there, like yeah. but. Um, what's the? I was going to ask you something about the. I was talking. You heard me talking the Potty McCrory yeah. about like he he obviously has a big fight. Um coming up I think he'll already have fought by this stage but anyway um, he um, and he was talking about like setting up an analysis and stuff like that and I think even with Antrim like it's something that we have sort of took to another level in the last couple of years like we're having full time people in doing that um, what what does that look like for you do you have like one night a week set aside for analysis or anything like that or so like obviously if we play Saturday usually what we'll do is a Monday or a Tuesday night we'll look at Saturday's game, you know, we right. clips of what we've done right, what we've done wrong, where we can improve and stuff. And then Thursday, obviously two nights before the Saturday game, we'll look at whoever we've got that weekend and going through their set pieces, what they do well, where we can exploit them, you know, stuff like that. So that's probably, I'm saying Monday or Tuesday, but it's one of them days we'll do uh. our own analysis on us and then Thursday we'll do it on whoever we've got that weekend. Class. And do you enjoy it? Like, do you enjoy sort of... <laughs> I'm the same. I'm the same. To be honest, like, I don't think anyone does, yeah. but I think it, it's just part of the game that you yeah. have to do. And you know, there is little details that you might you might think, oh, this is long, this is boring. But come a Saturday, if someone 
clears one off the lane because they were in the right position for a set piece you're going well you were there for a reason that's, that's why we've done that so you know it pays off in the long run yeah it's nearly just like crossing the d's and that in the eyes yeah. and then like it's Pretty just much. But as but as you say, if something does happen, then you can fall back on it. Yeah. That's that. Yeah. But I want to I want to talk about just briefly about um about the world of social media and it's something that I, like I, I'm I'd be very passionate about it and I talk to most of my guests about it um about sort of the negativity around social media and how that can affect everyone um but in a sporting sense it can affect us in a way. Um, like there's things like players boards and stuff like that and even like you know people giving off about you or even mm-hmm. you can see it on Twitter or Instagram or people putting comments about it, just negativity in general like and, and, and mm-hmm. we use playing in Clivenville like is there constantly being judged um, on your ability and what way you perform and most of the time you're shade <laughs> by people standing <laughs> you know in the stands and stuff like how, how do you use um how do you approach that in terms of switching off or not taking in what's going on around you? And I know, Stephen, like for you too, about being injured, and I'm injured too, and there's nothing as bad as someone coming up to me and being yeah. like, fuck, you're always injured, or you're yeah. always this. And I, I just want to f- choke them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, And it's it's very, yeah. very frustrating. And I just think, how do you block out that sort of negativity or that sort of... Even even whenever that does happen, you, and all, like, you can get a sense of self doubt as well because yeah. then you go, is that are they really right? Are they yeah, am I not good enough? Or am I always injured? Is this is never yeah. going to work out? How do you approach all that? Carry um, on. I think it's it's obviously very easy for people on the outside looking in to make comments, but they don't know actually what's going on or how hard things can be. Like you said about the injury, like people are saying, oh, you're always injured and whatnot. Like I don't choose to be injured. I don't want to be injured. <laughs> just happens and and it is tough and people don't see that people don't see the work that you put in to just try and get fit to maybe then get injured again so it can be like I remember even when I switched from Northern Ireland to Republic of Ireland I was only 16 I think and like obviously you, you don't you try to block out what you look for you don't go looking for stuff but I had like people commenting on my Instagram like rat emojis and <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, and you see that because you see your notifications, and it's just like at sixteen, I'm like, like why do people care? Like yeah. whatever. But then you kind of forget that you are on that little pedestal of like people do look up to you, people support the club you play for, so people care about what you're doing and and always want to have a say. Um, I know there will like there is players that probably do go looking for it and it can affect them because they see something they don't want to see I tend I just leave it in terms of uh, like after a game and well because I'm always injured I don't mind going on Twitter because <laughs> there's nothing really he just my <laughs> um, but like yeah in terms of if I'm playing if I've had a bad game I kind of know right stay away from Twitter because you're already in your own head in terms of your performance and you know you could have done better or whatever you don't need to be going on Twitter and seeing what other people are saying Obviously, they're entitled to their opinion and mm. they pay to come watch games and whatever. Like, I don't... If someone wants to say something about my performance, I'm not going to hold the gro- Like, I'm not going to be upset and, you know, go and have a go at them for it. Like, it's, they're entitled to their opinion. It's I think it's just up to us to kind of block it out and not go looking for it. Absolutely. It's your perception of the comments rather than the yeah. comments themselves. <clears throat> That's a good way of putting it, actually, because there's even certain times that some of the things I've read, even about me, like, and... It's actually a screen, my screen, you can't see it now, but um, if I can get rid of notifications, but anyway, it's it's a bit of paper, and I should give them my secrets now, but it's a bit of paper, <laughs> and it just says one dimension on it, because <clears throat> I remember someone writing about yeah. that about me, like, about being one, one dimensional, and that's, I only have one sort of tool in my box, or whatever, whatever it was, but it's something that I just use as a wee motivator, to like, yeah. to, to, to do new things, and I, to try and push on. I think on, like. it can work both ways, in a way, you know, yeah. like, obviously, like, say, you can, you can see the abuse, but I think other players, or people can, maybe if they're doing well, and they're getting the good comments, and they're reading that, and then they build themselves up, for a downfall, because, just feeding their egos, like. yeah, so I think, you've got to be careful of, like, obviously, like he says, you respect people's opinion in a way. If they feel that you were shit, fair enough. Like, we played Friday night and, then, like, I didn't have the best of games. And I said to him in the car on the way home, I was like, I'm not going on Twitter. Because you just know, like, like he says, you know yourself and you don't have a good game. So you're already thinking yourself of what could I have done. So you don't need to go on and see 
someone who's been there and says, right, such and such, you were shit. Like, fair enough, mate. I don't mind that, but I don't need to read it either. You know that way? But like I say, you could also have a good game and people build you up. But if you read too much into it, then you're going into the next game thinking, I'm on top of the world, mm. I'm the best player in the pitch, whatever. And then you're going to have a shit game and it's just like, from here, right back down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, if you're on a high, there's only one way you can really spend it. And that's why I, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago too, about just staying at that sort of six out of ten at all times. Like, even, you know, when you do get beat and you're on a low, like, for our own mental health and, like, get ourselves back up to the six. And if you're at a ten, get ourselves back down to the six mm. because there's a good balance there. Um, what way do you um, like see even whenever you do get beat or negativity does come your way do you would that like ruin your week or anything or ruin your day or what no, or no, do you like, just well, I, do you no. see it just as very much as sport and I mean I can't control it anymore and I'll get on with my life or what well, I think like the good thing about football you know there's loads of matches there's always a game next mm. week that mm. you can improve from um, but like I say I happened to, I did happen to see one comment on Twitter the other day and someone just went Gallagher was shit <laughs> I said, you know you can laugh it off and I, I probably probably should have agreed with him to be honest but you know I think like you just sort of deal with it yourself and how you, how you go about things yeah are you saying uh, yeah no see I think as well because I don't have another job like football is my life so I'm always thinking about football I find it hard to switch off yeah um like everything, I'm I'm just always thinking about football, whether I'm at training or I'm in the gym or I'm sitting in the house. Like I'm always thinking about the game at the weekend. Or so you can you, you can overthink um quite a lot. I yeah. I done a good bit with you know Philly McMahon that plays for Dublin. Dublin yeah. I done a good bit with him. He was in when I was at Bohemians, and we worked on that quite a bit in terms of the social media side and switching off from what is said and, and what and building a kinda message for yourself that you stick by and you can always go back to it and kinda but we called it a process so it was like any time things did go wrong we had our process that when we if it like we had it written down on a card and it was like you go back and read it and th- it kinda like put you back on. So it was like um if I did have a bad game and I'm seeing things it's like right, why am I doing this? And I look at my process and be like, right, I'm back on it now and, and you just get on with what you're doing. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm one that just constantly thinking about football. I find it hard to switch off. Yeah. And you, you actually, and that's that's actually class, what you just said there about Philly and stuff and, and, and the process. And it's nearly like a contingency plan. So if this happens, back yeah. to what we're talking about, even like nearly like a tactic, if you want to say, yeah. you know, if this happens, right, we'll go back and we'll stick to the process it's and we'll like trust reset. it. Yeah. Reset yeah. button and we'll actually trust it, you know. Yeah. Um, and whenever there's a core group of people doing that, yeah. it's powerful because yeah. uh, uh, like a, their success has to come with that too. Like, um, no, but I think I think where we're both as you are at now, and I suppose with Clevenbaugh, and you seem a bit settled and stuff like that. Can you see yourselves there for the next sort of for the foreseeable? Or well, I suppose got, football's a wee bit unpredictable, is it that way? Well, it can be very unpredictable, but like I've got two two years left in my contract, so you know I'm happy there. Mm. And you know, come to the end of two years, if they want to offer me a new deal, then happy days. But you know, like you say, football. It's unpredictable and, you know, anything can happen, like, so... But I'm happy enough right now. You're happy enough? Are you happy, yeah. see? No, I'm happy. Like, obviously, my, still my aim is to go back to England. Mm. Like, I only moved back a year and a half ago. Yeah. And when I moved back to Bohemians, my goal was to kind of use that as a stepping stone to get back. Um, And I've spent the year and a half injured, so it's... Obviously, at the minute, I'm focused on getting fit and playing for Cliftonville and doing well for Cliftonville. But my end goal is still to go back to England. Um, that's where I want to go and have a career. And I think I'd be upset at myself if I ended my career and didn't give everything to get back. get back there and have that career. So obviously at the minute I'm like I'm not looking beyond Cliftonville or anything because I know that's that's where I am now and and I've got to go and do well here to get to where I want to be. So. I'm happy, like, love where I am at the minute, like, it really, apart from obviously being injured, really enjoying it, like, so I want to get back fit and, and try to push on and achieve the things I want to achieve. Class, unreal. And would you, just to finish off, any advice would you have for any, uh, this is, this is, this is very, very important in my opinion because I have experienced it a lot with different friends. Would you have any advice for anybody 
young lads making that step to go across the water, like and going to live in digs and stuff and Um, I would say like just go and like embrace it, you know, mm. like you said at the start, you're going over as a child, you know, and you do have to sort of grow up very quickly. So just go and go and enjoy it. And to be honest, looking back, I would probably have maybe stayed a few extra years here and got sort of men's football under the belt and then went across. But like I don't I don't regret it in a way because I went the chance may never have came again. So you go and take it and do what you can, you know what I mean? Like I, mean, um, I I think just don't get caught up in the lifestyle. Yeah. That's yeah. very easy to do. Like I was going out sixteen from sixteen going to nightclubs. Going out every weekend after a win. And when you look back it's like I have so many years to do that. I moved away from home to be a footballer and I let that kinda get in the way. So I think it's it's don't get caught up in the lifestyle and, and be busy. Like you go over there and, and if you are doing extra work and you're staying behind to do finishing, you're coming in an hour and a half early, you're seen as busy and yeah. the lads all make an opinion so of it. Take but a piss earlier, but just mm-hmm. do it. What I've what I've noticed from over the years, the lads that do that are the ones that go on to have the career. I wish yeah. When I first moved over, I was like that. I wish I was in at 6 o'clock in the morning and leaving the academy at 5, 6. Because they're the lads that actually went on to have a career. And the opinion that people had on them in terms of the changing room, saying they were busy, if it's teacher's pet or whatever, yeah. it doesn't matter now because them lads are probably not playing and the lads that were doing it are, have gone on to achieve what they want to achieve or they're playing at a very good standard. Yeah, I agree with that because like... I know in my change room, it's really be like there was in terms of in the youth team, you know, there's there's always a group of like boys that'll look at the, that person doing a wee bit extra and it might be three or four of them and like we say, sort of taking the piss or calling you busy because you or that person are trying to improve on a certain area or aspect of the game and like he says, they're the ones not playing anyone anymore. But the one that's doing that, they got the new deal. Do you know what I mean? So it's it uh, that, that stuff pays off in the long run. Nearly like Stay in your own lane and be selfish because at the end of the day you're here to get the best version of you. Like, it's, ruthless, it's, all, yeah. it's a ruthless yeah. game, you know, and obviously, I, well, I learned that the hard way, different to him in terms of, I got my pro contract, had my pro year, and then like we were training one day and it was like, on on the pitch and was like right lads, well, there was five of us first year pros. Was, right, we'll have your meeting today. <laughs> so like you go into training that day, not expecting anything. Now you know it's sort of coming up because of the time of season. And then you're like, oh shit, like, I've got a meeting in the next two hours of whether I'm staying again or whether I'm going home. And, you know, just like that, I was on a boat within five hours back home. So, you know, it's just that's how ruthless it is. So just go and be selfish and look after yourself. Madness. That's class, like, <laughs> in, a, in a way, like, and I suppose... Well, no, it's not class. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's class even, like, to have that experience. Um, both of you, and to go now on and do what you're doing now with this new venture that you just have... Um, I personally don't think there's two better men after talking to you for the last while um, to go and offer your services and experiences to young lads or, or, or even girls um, wanting to better themselves and wanting, wanting the, a, a career within football and the both of you obviously have your head screwed on like and you're um, and you're two great lads like and, and I'm delighted that we're, we're starting up a, this wee partnership and, and I'm delighted that you're going to be ambassadors for Let's Face It so no the very best of luck with everything like and I suppose yeah, if there's anything I can do on my side to help you I definitely will and um and thanks thanks for coming on board like I really appreciate it Hello, thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Cheers. cheers and uh, yes again a huge thanks to RO Travel um for Aileen and David and Alistair and co um, for sponsoring this week's episode. It's greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, go check out all, uh, go check out Aero Travel on um, Facebook and the send the set up deals there every single day. And uh, you can go in and see them in the Andersonstown Road. They're just facing the busy bee. Um, they're brilliant. So go check them out. And uh, yeah, I appreciate all your support. And keep an eye out for the two lads. I'll be uh, tagging them on Instagram for their new page and go give them a follow and a like and all that carry on and if you're interested or know anyone who might be interested in um, developing their, their skills and their career and in, 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 in soccer like uh, give the two lads a shout and they'll be more than happy to help you um, enhance and improve so yeah brilliant thanks very much to everybody for, for tuning in and listening and I think uh, 
there's a lot that we got from both of, from both of their stories there and even Stevens there in terms of the gambling and stuff and we'll maybe go into that more in the next couple of weeks to get more guests on talking about gambling but uh, nah thanks very much for tuning in and I'll see you all next week thank you